Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, everybody. My name's Ken. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, Ken. Yeah. No, my mama told me early on if I couldn't say nothing, nah, don't say nothing at all. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, this guy that's up here to speak, uh, we, we came in about the same time. And, uh, you know, you just get close to some people. And this guy right here uh, is dear to my heart. I look at him like a brother. So listen with an open heart, an open mind. Josh C. I'm glad y'all clapped before I before I spoke. I'm Josh. I'm alcoholic. Is it all right if I sit down? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of my one of my favorite speakers says that uh, you never get rid of the butterflies. You just get them flying in formation. I hadn't got that down pat, but at least it's good to know that nobody gets rid of them. You know? So um, I was. I, I'm real grateful to be here. It's 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 great to to be doing something that you know left them on devices I'd have no no way of doing. Uh I wouldn't be able to sit up here and, and talk and, you know, share my life without with y'all without putting something in my body. Uh primarily alcohol. I mean that that was that was my go to. Um uh, that's what that's what worked. You know, I had a I had a spiritual problem but I had an alcohol solution for a long time. Um my sobriety day is January twenty fourth, two thousand eleven, which also happens to be my son's birthday. So uh you know, I, I I pray that I can continue to keep the same the same sobriety birthday. Uh, and one of the guys that's really close to me that when I came in, he was uh he's still a key person to me now. But he when I told him that, you know, I said I got sober on my son's birthday. He said it can always be that way. He said it can stay that way. So, um, but I've I've seen a lot of people come in, go out, and it really helps remind me. That uh that this thing's you know this this illness that we battle with call it an illness disease conflict whatever it is is real. Uh, matter of fact, I got a phone call yesterday that one of my sponsees was is in jail. Uh, I mean it's not funny. It's just that he's the one that called the cops. He just forgot he had four warrants for <laughs> for his arrest. So <laughs> that didn't work out too good for him. Uh, but uh. Hey, if this doesn't come off good, y'all can blame Mac and Ken because it, it was their idea for me to come speak. Uh, but I have been listening to a bunch of speakers this week, so I'm, you know, I'm planning on knocking y'all socks off. So. <laughs> uh, you know, my my childhood was uh, was a was a great, wonderful childhood. I mean, I had a loving family. Uh, my mom was different than anybody else's mom. She was born without arms, and so you know that kind of led things a little differently for me, but, and I really don't think that has any more to do with my alcoholism as, you know, my genetics or the fact that I just really like to drink. Uh, and so I, you know, I was raised in a Christian home and, and my parents were really, I mean, from the time I can remember, they were really not just religious, but spiritual. You know, they had their own, um, they, they really had their own relationship with God, uh, the way they understood him. And, they really lived on faith and were a really good example to me. So, you know, I can't blame anything. And I've had to reassure my mom that now that I've had some time to look over, uh, look over my life is, you know, mom, I said, the way I turned out didn't have any reflection on you. I said, y'all, y'all put me on the right path. I just, I chose to do what I wanted to do. Um, but they were, they were always, I mean, always loving. Um, and, and when I was 13, we moved to Dothan so my, my dad could go to uh, the Baptist College in Graceville. So my mom quit her job, my dad quit his job, and we just moved. And so for nine months, we were without any income or anything. But I never went without, never went without. So they really showed me some faith at, a, at an early age and showed me that, that a God thing is real. You know, we never went without, uh, like I say, I... I fill out an application for a, a free free lunch at school, and when I took it to the lady, to the lunchroom lady, took it back to her, she said, "You're gonna have to take this back. You know, your your parents forgot to fill something out." 
I didn't know, so I just took it back home, and they just started laughing. They said, it, that's it. Our income is zero. And so when I took it back to her, I said, they told me to tell you that that's, that's what it is. She's like, it's impossible. There's no way your income can be zero. I said, well, you know, if, if you don't believe me, just call them. So um, so I was in church pretty much from, you know, as far back as I can remember. That was that was their goal. You know, that was one of their goals was to have me grounded. I had some family members, uh, specifically my granddad, who my mom didn't allow me to be around very much at all just because her childhood was, was a disaster. It was, you know, he was a, a raging alcoholic and had some real radical viewpoints on things and ran with, with a lot of people that, that weren't upstanding citizens. You know, it, it was more than once that he served some 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 time, but he had all the folks in town in his pocket, so he was able to, to really do what he wanted to. But my mom made sure that I wasn't exposed to that very much. And, you know, still to this day, I thank her for that because that that's something that has allowed me to continue to be open-minded. Um, I didn't, I remember trying to sip a beer or something, you know, when I was real little. It, that's all I remember is picking up off the table and talking about how gross it was. When I was 14, I had my first drunk. A friend of mine and I got a 12-pack of Corona, and that was that was plenty. And it was great. I mean, it was conviviality. It was what the book talks about. You know, it was a, a great experience. And, you know, it's still one of those experiences where I think about, you know, it's still, it's one of the funny ones. But I loved it. But I didn't drink again until I was 18. Uh, I was in church, went to mission trips, helped with vacation Bible school, helped with all this stuff. And a part of me was scared to do that. But another part of me looked down my nose at people who did that. You know, I, I thought, I had some friends that would smoke, and man, I, I would, I would tell them, you know, how bad they were, and you know how how they weren't doing right. And I really thought they were some losers, and you know that that would that would change. They, you know, several years later, they'd be telling me what I'm doing is is a little much, uh, <laughs> because they, you know, I was I was always drinking. I thought everybody else was always drinking too. But the thing about it was, is I wasn't with the same people every night, so I was with different people every night. I was the only one that was drinking every night, and, and then it got to be during the day. Um, so I really, you know, I can't say that I felt like I was different or an outcast or anything, you know, growing up. I, I was really embraced with love, and, and my parents didn't shelter me. You know, I was I was insulated from a lot. Uh, I didn't, didn't see, I never remember my parents having beer or alcohol or anything uh, in the home. The, that one time when I was little that they had, that it was there, it was one of my uncles. And he he was one of the he was one of the happiest people that I I perceived to be happy my whole life, and so from a young age I did associate alcohol and and fun, you know that that was that was my perception. This, this dude, I mean he was happy go lucky all the time, and he always had a beer in his hand. So you know to me that was kind of the you know that <laughs> that made sense. So when I first got here, I, I I'll tell you I couldn't fathom life. To continue drinking, and I couldn't fathom life without it. You know, I, at first, I really did it to have fun. But then by the time I got here, and, you know, by the time I, I really uh, was at that, that helpless, hopeless state, I couldn't imagine my life either way. And so, so I, I'd really run out of options. I tried everything that I knew, and, you know, most of the suggestions that, that were given to me. But, so I, I, I don't remember really being, you know, feeling different until we moved down here and then it was kind of like you know it was a big a big change even though it's from north alabama south alabama um it was still you know it was still a big change from being away from all my friends and family and, and i did become a little more isolated a little more introverted and but i still had baseball and i had sports and stuff like that that was my life you know that became my life it it was spending all my time playing sports and but when uh when i turned 18 or when I turned 17, I can't remember, 17 or 18, one of my friends that was a, a real party, a partier, threw me a party. And they got some stuff, I think it's called Aftershock. And I had never had it before. But she told me that it was something that, you know, tasted good. So I said, all right. And before I knew it, the whole bottle was gone. I mean, it, it was it was gone. And so was I. Uh, I remember... <laughs> I remember being in the bathroom floor pretty early. You know, most everybody else was, was still doing what they do. Uh, 
but I did feel different. You know, I don't recall much of that night other than feeling like I wanted to, you know, feeling like they looked, feeling like they were, you know, feeling like I was enjoying things and, you know, I, I was on top of, I was on top of everything. Um, that, that night was, was rough and the next morning was even rougher because it was Sunday morning. And as I said before, I had to go to church every Sunday morning, no matter what. Uh, and I was still living at home. So, so daddy saw to it that I still went to church. He knew what was going on and it was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was painful, but I was still looking forward to doing it again. You know, I'd kind of been turned on to something. I, in my, in my mind at that, at that point, I was tired of living this boring humdrum life. I'm, I'm fixing to have fun. It was time for me to have fun. And so that's what I did. And started running with, you know, different people that I'd, you know, kind of stayed away from before. And because I wanted to see how they were having fun. You know, that was the, that, that was the cool thing to do and in my eyes. And so I wanted to try it. And, you know, alcohol was, was there for me. I, I really never was much of a beer drinker. I, I really liked whiskey and you know from a from a very early point uh i could drink a lot of whiskey and so i thought when my parents they, they tried to warn me before i ever drank you know this this deal runs in our family this is this is what killed that that same uncle that i was talking about he died at 40 years old of a heart attack and so come to find out he had he had taken way too much of of something uh while he was <laughs> intoxicated uh so they they let me know that and then told me, you know, my mom's dad and my dad's dad, and my dad's uncle. They said, you know, this, this deal is real and it runs in our family. So, you know, you may have some basically They said you're going to have some tendencies. So the best thing to do is just leave it alone. Uh, and I said, well, I'm going to find out. You know, there's, <laughs> we're going to see if I can drink like they did. Uh, but really, in the back of my mind the whole time, even when they were telling me that, you know, my thinking is I'm not that way. I've got it. You know, even, I'm just going to do it till I get tired of it, and I'll stop. You know, I'll stop when I get ready, but I, I didn't ever want to stop. Um, so I started, like I say, I started running with with a different crowd and was still working, uh, still holding down a job there for a little while. And you know, I started working from the time I was 15, you know, worked on the farm, clipped cantaloupes, watermelons, loading trailers, and doing doing what I had to do to buy my first car because I wanted that freedom. And continued, I've, I've always had a job since. So that, that was kind of, you know, looking back, once I had some time to really look at a sixth and seventh step, you know, a job was a lot like a relationship with a girl or a woman. That's, that's how I, I viewed, it. that's what validated me. You know, that's something that, that validated me was, you know, what kind of job did I have? What kind of vehicle did I have? What kind of girlfriend did I have? You know, and it, and it wasn't, you know, the girlfriends I would choose would not necessarily be ones that, I wanted to get to know. It, it wanted to be, it was ones that I wanted people to see me with. You know, it was kind of a status. And, and so, so were the jobs for a little while. Um, and then I started getting into some more things, you know, that kind of go along with alcohol. I'm definitely alcoholic and haven't questioned that since I worked the first step. Now I had to, I had to have some help being convinced, um, uh, that I'm alcoholic and, but alcoholism took me down several roads, you know, and I never, Never thought that I would go down some of them, you know. I never thought I'd be an abusive husband. Never thought I'd be, you know, uh, a drug addict, uh, a, an alcoholic. I never thought I would put the things in my body that I did, but alcohol took me down those, those, those streets. And I know the promises say, you know, we won't regret the past or wish to shut the door on it. And I don't today. There's still a lot of things I'm not proud of. I don't know that I ever will be proud of. Um, you know, to me, as, as a young, child and all the way up even when I was doing it you know an abusive an abusive husband was was scum and so that's that's really the way I felt about myself and so I drank from the guilt that I of the things I did I drank from the guilt of the things I didn't do and so you know the guilt and the shame was was pretty heavy when I got here it, it was really the most unbearable thing because I couldn't stand me any more drunk or sober and I just I couldn't stand me there, there was nothing about me I could stand um but some of those as some people like to call them outside issues, I'm just going to say some of those other things that go with alcohol, you know, started changing my thinking. You know, I started having these even more glorified dreams and aspirations of what I'm going to do. And so since baseball was a big thing for me, 
uh, I decided that, you know, this job I had for four years wasn't important anymore. I'm going to quit work, go work construction. I'm going to quit work, quit college, work construction so I can work out. And then I'm going to come back and walk on, you know, and I'm going to try out for baseball and, you know, everything's going to work out just like I'd planned it. Well, everything happened except me working out for baseball. <laughs> I quit work. I quit school. Uh, and then just overindulged in, in everything I could get my hands on. Uh, and, and my, my favorite was whatever's available. You know, it's what do you have? I want some. You know, give me two or three. And if, if three does you good, I want four. And so that's the way I, I viewed life for a, a long time. Uh, I was still able to hold down, well, not a steady job, but, you know, I had, I did different things, ways to, <laughs> really ways to support my habits uh, while I was still living at home. And then, then came the point when my mom, now I've got a younger sister, and so then came the point when my parents said, you know, enough's enough. You know, we're not going to allow her to be exposed to this. We're not going to expose her to it. You're not either. And so if you're not willing to quit, time to go. And so, you know, I said, fine, I'd rather go anyway. Uh, the only problem was I didn't have anywhere to go and didn't, <laughs> didn't have any money to get anywhere to go. So what I do is I, you know, take advantage of, of a relationship that, you know, I started with a girl because I knew she really liked me. And so I called her up. I called her up and, and let her know that, you know, I was being put out. And I knew she'd feel sorry for me, and she did. She said, well, I've got this extra room. I said, well, that'll be fine, just, you know, just long enough till I get on my feet. And uh, about 18 months later, we got married. Uh, <laughs> like any good alcoholic, I just figured, you know, what, what, the, what the heck, let's just go ahead and do this. I'm not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. That was my logic. You know, that, that was my rationale. Uh, our relationship was really based on... Uh, a lot of things that, you know, relationships shouldn't be based on. It's just, uh, we had similar interests then. Um, but, you know, I did finally at my dad's uh, encouraging landed a really good job. Uh, this factory in, in Dothan manufacturing uh, company. You know, he had pushed me to go to the, back then it was the employment office. You had the unemployment office, then you had the employment office. He said, when you go fill out for unemployment, Walk over to the employment office. He said, it's probably going to be the most depressing place you've ever been to, but it may be worth it. And so I did. Uh, didn't really have many other options. And landed a, a really, really good job. Um, you know, and, and I had I had some pretty big dreams when I started working there. I started out sweeping the floor, and, and that basically worked my way up to a machine operator and fixer and supervisor and actually wound up as manager uh, and then traveled for them for a, a good bit. But the whole time this is going on, my, my drinking is really just evolving. I mean, it's, it's really growing and, and growing steam. You know, I, I knew when I was 20, that was when I started this job, and I could drink a, a fifth of whiskey by myself in one night. There might be, you know, there might be an issue. But I, I really, I wore it like a badge. You know, to me, you know, I can do this. Not many, not many other folks can. So, you know, I'm going to continue to do that. And then I found some other things that helped me drink even more and not, you know, not get sick. So... Um, I was proud of it, but, but really drinking, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say that I didn't enjoy it. You know, at this point, I don't, I can't say whether I was drinking against my will or not because I didn't want to do anything but drink. You know, I never tried quitting at this point. Uh, but I, I did know, I did notice that, you know, I can drink a lot more than, than most people I know. And the, the obsession started about this time to where if I wasn't drunk or, you know, if I was at work, I was already thinking about what I'm going to drink by one or two, you know, in the afternoon. What am I going to drink tonight? And so then it became the daily, just just the evening thing. But it was still still really, really heavy drinking. Um, continued progressing with this company. It was making really good money. Uh, like I said, I got married. Uh, that lasted. That was a really good relationship for about a week. While, <laughs> while, while we were on the honeymoon in the mountains, it was great. You know, it was, uh, we had a really nice cabin. Um, <laughs> when I got back home, um, there were there were good times. I mean, she she was a a very loving woman. Of course, she was to put up with me as long as as long as what she did. Uh, she was very tolerant, obviously. But I think you know some of that has to do with with kind of her perception too. But uh, anyway, you know, we had our first child in 2004 
when his birthday is. Yeah. And then I started traveling to China with this company. And when I got over there, I mean, I was, I was living like a king. You know, I really felt like a rock star. That's, you know, I, in my mind, I was thinking everybody should be doing what I'm doing right now. You know, they should be living this way. They should be getting everything they want, just like I'm getting it. So my ego is just swelling. I mean, it is, it got so big that when I moved over there, I had to have a seven story, I mean, a four story apartment. Now that's how big my ego swelled up. And I, I wouldn't settle for a, you know, two bedroom apartment yeah, over there. I just wasn't going to do it. Um, but my, my drinking was really, really, it started becoming a round the clock deal. You know, I, I didn't have necessarily a boss while I was there. So, you know, I could stay up till two or three in the morning. And those guys, I mean, those folks over there work 16, 18 hour shifts. So I knew that, you know, I could go in late and just work late with them. So, you know, it was really ideal. I just start late. Just, I just wouldn't start at the same time they would, but I'd work until they, you know, until they knocked off. And really had some had some success with with my projects, you know, with the things that I was asked to do. Um, and then, you know, everything was expensed off through the company. So I was I was kind of getting turned on to some nice name brand liquor and, and whiskey and so and scotch. And so when I got back home and the expense account was was no longer available, it, it really <laughs> really put a dent in my bank account because I thought I still had to have that same stuff. And I did, like on payday, but then, you know, <laughs> the rest of the week it was, uh, it was the, the stuff they keep below the shelf, you know, <laughs> up under the bottom shelf. Old Crow became my, my favorite for a long time. I even got to where I mixed Old Crow with Gatorade. That's, that was, <laughs> that was rough, that, but I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> nobody would, nobody would drink my drink if I left it sitting there. <laughs> I remember offering, you know, when folks would come over, I'd offer them a drink. Said, no, that's that's okay. <laughs> don't, don't want any of that. Uh, but it it was that was that's who I became. And for a while, I was proud of it. You know, for a while, a while I was really proud of it. I was making really good money. Uh, when my son was twelve, twelve or thirteen months old, I moved to China and, and lived there for almost a almost a year. I'd come home. Uh, after a few months and stay for a month or so and then go back. And so this is when I had my own home there and didn't have any accountability for anything. And that that's not good for me. You know. It's really not good for me sober. It's definitely not good for me, you know, uh, you know, in a whirlwind. And that's, that's really what was going on. Didn't really have much success for those nine months compared to, you know, the couple of weeks that I had been going before, you know, I had a lot more success in the short periods of time. But I became the life I was living required me to drink. You know, the things that I was doing required me to drink. I I, I, I began drinking, you know, without even thinking about it. Not necessarily against my will, but you know, without any thought. You know, drinking is going to be part of what I'm doing. Uh, if I was going out with my friends there, I had to drink a lot before I went because I didn't want them to see how much I was drinking. You know, I finally met one guy over there that I really liked because he didn't shoot uh, Chinese wine, which is just rice wine. He didn't shoot it out of a shooter like this. We shot it out of a bowl, you know, <laughs> and that was his style. And so uh, he was the mayor of that town, so I really liked him. You know, we hit it, we hit we hit it off, and and I became the designated drinker for my company because my boss from here didn't drink, and the general manager there didn't drink, and over there it's customary. You know, if if the person that you're courting is, is drinking. Somebody better drink with them. So I just had to, I had to step up to the plate for him. <laughs> uh, there was there was one time, you know, he he really gave me a compliment. He said, he said, just last week I was drinking with a marine and he ain't got nothing on you. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's how we do it in Dixie. Uh, <laughs> but it, it it really became. I mean, the things I was doing uh, were really eating and eroding away at my soul and you know the, the things that that married men don't do and that you know good fathers don't do in my in my mind you know but I was still doing them uh, because it's what I wanted and I wanted it right then so it's what I did and some things were going on back home you know between my wife and uh, some some friends and I caught wind of it from her mom and my mom and my friends and so <clears throat> she and I talked 
And I told her that, you know, if she would just promise not to do it again, we'd let it go. You know, that kind of eased my conscience. So, you know, little little did she know the reason I was so willing to work through it is because I was doing things 20 times worse. So, and that's one of those amends that it says, unless it would harm others. That's one of those amends where I've just left, you know, where it is. And she and I get along better now today than we ever did before. You know, we, we get along much better now, and, and our children, two children we have together, have a somewhat healthy, you know, home environment. You know, ironically, I've become the stable parent in their life, and, and that's only by the grace of God and, and this program. You know, I, I didn't know how to be a good friend. I didn't know how to be a good worker or anything before I got here. All I knew how to do was please me. That's it. That, that's all I knew how to do. So, But by working this program and, and by... You know, taking some suggestions, I can be the father that I'm supposed to be. I can be the man that God created me to be. And that's that's only by working these steps and, and through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I was listening to a speaker today, and I may chase some rabbits. And if I say we'll get back to that, we probably won't get back to it. But I was listening to a speaker today, and, and it, it dawned on me that, you know, we do come to, to AA, me. I came to AA to help get sober. But then I don't stay necessarily just to stay sober. You know, I, I stay really at, at the end of the day. The reason we come to AA is so we can have a relationship with God. And so we can get all that crap out of, out of our way that's blocking us off from God. And for me, that crap was, was what I was putting in my body. But it was also that ego and it was also that, that ism that I was feeding. You know, it's just self. Uh, it's what does Josh want? How am I going to get it? You know, and when? Uh, that, it's just a matter of time. <clears throat> You know, in the in the book it says, you know, when the farmer comes out after the tornado, you know, ain't it grand the wind stopped blowing, Ma? You know, and, you know, to me, if I would have come and just got sober, I didn't even think that was going to happen when I got here. But if, but if I would have stopped there, I really would have sold myself short. I would have sold my children short. I would have sold my mom short. You know, I would have sold everybody around me short just because this program has added to my life. And, you know, it hasn't necessarily helped me restore life it's helped rebuild a life and it's it's one that's been built on things that matter you know things that don't cost money it's, it's integrity it's honesty it's um you know it's it's just it's healthy relationships and i've only learned that through this program um but kind of getting back to to where i was when i, I did move back home because i just felt like you know, there there was a wedge being driven between me and my family, and I thought it was where I was that was driving the wedge. Uh, and so when I moved back, things got worse. I mean, they got way worse. Uh, my family would have been better off if I'd have stayed gone because the next six, five or six years was was hell. I mean, it, it was literal hell. My children were my children were exposed to things that that children shouldn't see. You know, they they should not see their father being abusive to their their mother. You know, they shouldn't see that. Uh, and that's something that I can't take back. Now, fortunately, sometimes today, you know, when my son's talking to me, he has no recollection of these things. But I know it's still in him. You know, I, I believe some, you know, I, my beliefs today are totally different than, a lot different than what they were when I got here. But I believe that, you know, children like that, they, they absorb that energy and, and the things that are going along with it. So, you know, but I know God's going to take care of them. And I know God's going to help work through that. Um, but those, those next those next few years were really just a, a whirlwind. I mean, it was a tailspin. Uh, I, I was still able to, to perform at work. You know, I, I found some, you know, a year of the baseball players talking about performance enhancers. I found some performance enhancers that really helped me, you know, at work. So I didn't have to smell like alcohol at work. And but it was just it was something to get me out of me so I could be who I thought you wanted me to be, you know, and so I could perform on the level that, you know, my ego told me I needed to perform at. And so I was still moving up in the company and actually was going to school uh, to get a degree. The company was paying for it. And I had my sights set on a, you know, a high level job in in this small company. And things were kind of heading that way. And then then my. Uh, my disease, my illness really took hold of me. I mean, I, I couldn't, I, it, I wasn't to the point where I was trying to stop, 
but I was trying to at least reduce the amount of things I was putting in my body. You know, I, tr- I tried church. Uh, we tried we tried just going to church on some days and then tried joining some small groups. I tried reading the Bible. In fact, there were there were several times where I would still be drunk from the night before, and I had my own office at at the company I worked at, and I would I would sit and read the Bible for you know hours for a couple of hours, still drunk, trying to find you know the answer, trying to find the solution of, of what I need to do. But for me, and I'm not saying the church doesn't work, but for me at church, I felt like I had to get my life right before I could get right with God. And what I found in this program is God just wants me right where I am. You know, He He wants He just wants to meet me right where I am, and that that's, that was a real humbling uh, realization for me is that you know some my creator cares enough about me to love me right where I am and you know he gave me free will and he did give me an abundance of it but he still he still just wants to love me where I am and so today I want to keep the things out of out of the way of of my relationship with him which is you know dishonesty fear anger the resentment and, and today I have this program to work through those things so I can continue a relationship with God because that's the most valuable thing I have in my life. Um, that's the only thing I have in my life that is that is permanent. That's the only thing that's permanent. You know, my my relationship with people is not permanent. My you know health is not permanent. Nothing's permanent except my relationship with God. And so I, I was searching for that. I was searching for some kind of truth in the Bible. You know, when I was reading it drunk. You know, and I'd have friends over and you know I'd talk about the Bible, you know, and I talk about the Old Testament and what happened with, you know, David's uh, descendants. And I even tried to trace, you know, my lineage back to King David, you know, I, <laughs> I was going to find it, you know, I, I knew I was connected to him somewhere in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, but let me, let me stop to say that I'm, I'm still a self-centered, self-centered, selfish uh, person. You know, I, clean up what I say because we got a little man in here, but I, I'm, I'm really still very selfish and self-centered. Uh, just a little story, and I'm going to tell him myself. I'm probably going to pay for this later. Uh, but my wife and I were riding, my wife and I were riding down the road a couple of weeks ago and had her little dog with us. Notice I said it's her little dog. It's not ours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had the windows down, you know, just heading to a family reunion for her uh, with her grandmother's family and we don't get but about five or six miles from the house and this dog well I look over at the window the window's down and I'm thinking maybe I should let this window up nah she won't jump out because she's standing like looking out two minutes later she's gone I look in the, in the side view mirror and she's flipping and rolling I thought oh my god this dog's dead and by that time my wife jumps out I guess she's going to chase her but so I put it in reverse. I mean, it's a scene. There, there's there's cars back at the the stop sign, and I'm driving in reverse to to, to try to keep them from hitting the little dog because she took off running the opposite way. Finally, I got her. You know, the first thing that crossed my mind was I'm not going to get any of Grandmama's cake. <laughs> my wife's grandmother makes some of the best chocolate cake and best peanut butter cake. That's how selfish I am. I wasn't thinking. I wasn't thinking about her and her feelings. I wasn't thinking about the dog, and I was thinking about me not getting cake. <laughs> and then we pull. Then I pull over and finally get the dog in the car. And I, I like these shirts. I just got this one and another one the other day, and it's blue. Well, I pick the dog up and I get blood on my sleeve, and I'm thinking, my God, I'm not going to get blood out of my sleeve. <laughs> I just got. I just got blood on my new shirt. I wasn't thinking about the dog. I put her in the seat over there so she won't get blood on me, and then let uh, and then let my wife get in the car. But I just I just want to say that because I don't want y'all to get the perception that I think that I'm cured or that I'm fixed. You know, I still have to continue to do this thing on on a daily basis because that that to me, you know, anybody who doesn't have a, a selfish and self centered core would think about either their spouse, you know, their feelings about this dog being hurt, or the dog at least. But no, I'm thinking about my cake. <laughs> uh, fortunately, fortunately, I have some self-awareness today that this program has given me that I can see that, and I don't have to act on it. You know, she did call me out while she was crying. You know, mid mid sob and said, "I'll get the blood out of your shirt." So 
<laughs> At least let me know somebody's some, between one of us, somebody's working a program. <laughs> uh, but having uh, having having truth, knowing truth today is is, is the most amazing thing that, that I've ever been given, and it's not something that that I looked for when I got here. If you would have told me to make a list of what I think is going to happen, you know, by coming to AA, I would have put. I don't know, maybe meeting new people. You know, that, that might have probably been the extent of it. Uh, I really had no no expectations. Um, just to kind of speed things along, you know, my last my last drunk, uh, and as as y'all can relate, it's not just that one drunk that you say I'm done. You know, I I tried to quit hundreds of times before. I'm finished. You know, I'm, I'm through. I'm through. But then by eleven o'clock the next day, is how am I going to get it? You know, how am I going to get that bottle? How am I going to get what I need to put in me? How am I going to find my drink? And and I would go, you know, at whatever cost is is what it would take. I mean, uh, our debit card, my debit card was connected to a savings account, and I didn't care how far deep it went into it. Uh, I didn't care. You know, I, I'd gotten, let me back up, I'd gotten fired, laid off, fired from, from the, the good job that I had. Um, but they gave me three months severance package, finished paying for my school. Basically, they just they just said we're doing away with this position. It's not your performance. I, I knew better, and I, I really knew better because I, you know, looking back, there's no way that I could have been fooling everybody the way I thought I was fooling them. There, there's no way. Um, you know, if if I wasn't smelling like it, I was sweating it out of my pores. I mean, there, there's there's no way. But I think the the only thing worse than you know, scolding an alcoholic is giving them a reward. So they gave me three months pay, you know, for, to do nothing. And that, that, uh, that gave me a long time to sit at the house, you know, and do what I wanted to do. And, you know, looking back, the, the folks that I was running with, we were all laid off. We were all fired at that time. <laughs> there were like five of us that would hang out of my house every day because none of us had a job. But I just thought the economy was bad. I mean, it was just, it was just a, <laughs> it was just a really bad economy. And so, you know, it was just causing a problem in, in all our lives. And, but they were all doing the same things I was, you know, and, uh, I, I would substitute what I was putting in my body at different times, but alcohol was always there. And alcohol was always my go-to. You know, it, it would take me, where I wanted it to take me, you know, if, if I was pissed, it would comfort me, you know, if I was happy, it, it would help me celebrate, you know, if, if I was, uh, excited, you know, it would, it would help calm me down, and, and it, it was, it was always there, if I was too high, it would help bring me down, if I was too low, it would help bring me up, and so it, it was always my constant, you know, it's, it got to where, you know, I didn't hide bottles all over the house, because I didn't really have to, I was married to a drinker at the time, so, I mean, she, she wasn't keeping count, because she didn't want me to count her bottles. So you know, there wasn't a need to hide it. I, I did try to hide some, you know, tried to hide things from my children, but, you know, it, it would always come out what was going on. They just, they saw erratic behavior. They saw some, some, uh, some just a, a, a sick living arrangement. They really did. And, you know, th there was times during that period where I was laid off. What I started doing is, you know, when I was 20, when I first started with this company, I started putting into my 401k and started you know, increasing it every time I got a pay raise. So I really had a big 401k when they let me go. And I said, you know what? That's my money. I'm going to go ahead and use it. That's mine. I earned it. So I'm going to take this vacation. And so within about six or seven months, I blew through about $45,000 just gone. And, you know, that was stealing from my family. I mean, that really, that's what that was. I, I, I did pay the bills. Yeah, I paid the house payment and made all that stuff while I was doing it. But really what I was spending it on was, was not supporting my family. And it wasn't to help me look for, you know, a new career path to support my family. Uh, and, but I would spend some time with my kids, but I had to, I had to drink. I had to put in to know how to be around. You know, I, I couldn't be around them sober. I just, I didn't know how to be. So, and I, I remember one time taking my son to Adventureland <laughs> and taking him to the bathroom, telling him to wait at the sink so I could get in the stall. And, you know, put something in my body so I could act and, and feel the way I needed to. And to me, that was normal. You know, I had to do that. I didn't, 
I didn't see anything wrong with it necessarily. I mean, my, my conscience was getting at me, but, you know, I could just tone that down with, a, you know, another one. And so that that's the way it got for a, a few years. What I would try to do is, is you know, try to talk to uh, my friends that were doing the same thing, tell them, I, you know, I need to, I need to cut out this or I need to cut out that or just do it, you know, in the morning or just do it at night or, uh, so, so I really, I really tried all those avenues. Well, my last drunk, the cops got called the morning after I'd been drinking and I was still, uh, I don't remember much from that night. You know, I was, I was still pretty obliterated by the time they got there. Uh, I had locked my kid's mom out of the house and then she called the cops and I decided I'm going to go pretend like I'm sleeping. So, you know, when, when the cop gets here, I don't have to talk to him, but now that, that, that didn't work out. Uh, he pretty much drew down on me and told me if I don't get out of the bed, he's going to get me out of the bed. So I got out. Uh, I said, but I'm in my underwear. He said, I don't care. You know, it, it's, you do it or I do it. And so I just remember sitting there talking with them, talking with the other cop on the front porch. And, you know, several, several, several times, you know, hundreds of times, Whenever we would fuss and argue, you know, my wife would tell me it's over. You know, the, the, the D word got flung around all the time. You know, divorce. That, you know, I'm leaving, taking. You know, that happened hundreds of times. But this this day, this morning, I was sitting out there talking with the cops, and and you know, nobody had a mark on them, so they couldn't. I knew they couldn't do anything. You know, and I claimed that she hit me. You know, and so I, I knew that they couldn't. If they didn't have any proof of either one, that they they couldn't take me. Uh, so. So he was just, he was sitting there talking to me, trying to figure out, you know, if things were going to calm down. He said, you know, what's this all about? What's this all over? I said, man, it's, it's about something that happened like four years ago. He said, so you're holding on to a problem that's happened four years ago? And you're still having problems about it now? I said, well, yeah, I guess. And it, it hit me. That's, that's pretty insane. You know, that's pretty insane. And it wasn't just that problem. It was everything that surrounded it. It was my guilt, my shame. But I, I used that as fuel. I used what happened then as fuel. And so I remember when they left, and I remember sitting in our game room that, you know, my wife came out there and she said, it's done. I'm done. And I could tell in her eyes she meant it like never before. And she took the kids, and I, I guess they went to her mom's or her aunt's or something for uh, for the weekend. Now that happened on a Friday night. So Saturday morning they left. Well, bye. Sunday evening, you know, I I kept trying to drink, kept trying to drink, and it wouldn't wouldn't do anything. Um, I don't know if I drank so much because there was times in the past where, you know, I'd get so drunk the night before that if I drank more the next day, I'd just turn red, you know, in my throat or in my chest. It really, I didn't ever really get a buzz. It might would keep keep me where I was, but I just remember that night just crying out, God help me. What have I done? How do I get out of this? You know, and so I called my mom, and she had told me a year and a half before that. She said, "If if you ever want help, I'll help you get help." She said, "But you got to want." It. And I thought at that time, y'all are the ones that need the help. Leave me the hell alone. I'm gonna do what I do. And you know, y'all are the ones with the problem. You've got a problem with what I'm doing. I don't have a problem with it. But that that night, I called her and I said. You know, like like any good strong man, Mama, help me. <laughs> Mama, I need your help. Mommy, please. And uh, she had me an appointment that next day. You know, I was I was working a job. I had another job by by this time, and I was again a manager over another facility. I don't know why people kept putting me in management jobs. I guess I interview well. <laughs> that's, that's all it could be. But. Uh, so it was a 24-hour operation. So I changed my, I changed my shift, made an executive decision. I'm gonna start working night shift, you know. So she and I coexisted for a little while, you know. So she'd have the kids at night. I'd be there in the morning to help get them ready, get them to school, or get my son to school and my daughter to daycare. Oh, uh, and my mom got me an appointment with a facility in Dothan, and so I went and met with. Uh, I guess somebody that, that does check in. I, I don't know what to call it. But the lady said, okay, uh, I've, I've, I've evaluated it, but I need to turn your file over to my supervisor. And I was honest with her. I was more honest with her than anybody I've ever been with before. And I had been to counseling and things before, 
You know, the longest I'd ever stopped drinking before was about four months when I got engaged the first time. Uh, so I thought I had it licked then. You know, I, I'm making too big of a deal out of this. You know, it's time it's time to drink another. And that was about seven years before before this. But anyway, I was I was more honest with that lady that day than anybody I'd ever been before. And she said, I've evaluated it, but I've got to give it to my supervisor to let her evaluate it. I said, okay, I can wait. She's like, no, no, we'll, uh, we'll mail you, you know, our recommendation, whether, whether it's IOP or whether it's inpatient. I, I just sat there and I said, I can't, I didn't tell her, but I told myself, I can't wait on the mail. There's no way I can wait on the mail. I know what I'm going to do if I wait on the mail, um, because I was off the rest of the day and didn't have a plan of what to do. So I called my mom as soon as I left, and I said, Mom, I said, there's no way I can wait on the mail. You know, I can't, on my own, I can't stay sober a day. I can't stay sober half a day. How am I going to wait on the mail? And so anyway, I wound up at another treatment center, and, and it was, you know, I've heard Max say it before, I'm not a, you know, uh, an opponent of treatment or a, a proponent of treatment, but but it was the real deal because it was based on the, on the steps in this program. And... You know, my group counseling sessions were just me and the counselor. <laughs> I was the group. And so that, that's what my ego needed because she was ready to deflate it as soon as I came in the door. She called me on my crap from the very first day. And But part of the requirements of me going there were to, you know, start working the steps, go to meetings and, and, and all this stuff that I had no idea what she was talking about. I had no idea. You know, I, I've been arrested a couple of times before for some small small charges and had to go through CRO. So I had to go to some meetings, but I've never heard anything they said. Can't even tell you where I went. Uh, but this time what was a little different. I, I was, I was ready. I mean, I, I was ready to take somebody's suggestions and this lady seemed to know more than I did. Um, turns out at that time she had 15 years sober. And, and so she was a member of AA. She didn't tell me that till after everything was over. But, uh, so I started going to meetings and, and waited until the last minute to get a sponsor. I didn't want to drag somebody else through my crap. You know, I listened to the meetings, and, and I still do today. I still try to listen to everybody that's speaking to try to either get something that I want to know or something I don't want to try. You know, I, I try to hear everybody that's sharing. Um, sometimes I'm not real good at that because I, I think I know better than them. But, yeah, I, I really do try to be open-minded and, and because this this is where I learned to love. You know, this is where I've learned to, to be tolerant, to be kind. And, and, you know, it's one thing to do it in here, but do I carry it, do I carry it with me? And that, that to me is, is not more important, but it's just as important as, as doing it here. You know, we can, I think we can all do it for an hour or two, you know, and, and, and feel good, but can we really take it home? And in my home life, you know, with my children, especially, they're nine and four, that's, where my serenity is tried the most. Uh, that's where I'm not going to say I struggle, but that that's where I really have to. That's where I spend the most time in prayer. You know, I, I spend the most time in prayer when it comes to my children, and and my my stepchildren. You know, all four of ours help help keep me close to God. Uh, <laughs> we have a 14 year old and a 16 year old. <laughs> yes, I am. Oh, uh, but but they're great. I mean, I, I love them. Uh, I, I love them unconditionally, and, and the relationship I have with my children and my wife today is because of this program. You know, I've I've learned how to be a good husband. I've I've learned how to treat a woman because of this program. You know, there's there's no no two ways about it. You know, I've I've never never been in a relationship where I was really even remotely concerned about their happiness and well-being, unless it was going to directly affect mine. Uh, this is this is the first relationship I've ever been in that her happiness means more to me than my happiness, and it's, it's really the first relationship that I've I've learned that it's more important to love than it is to be loved, you know. Uh, and all that is due to this program, and to continue to continue this thing. You know, I hear some folks say that you know ten and eleven are the maintenance steps, but to me they're not maintenance steps. You know, I'm not just trying to stay where I am. To me, they're growth steps. And I want to continue growing. I want to continue growing closer to God. And I do it, you know, in, in other ways. But prayer and meditation, you know, that's, I don't put a limit just on the big book. You know, that's not, 
It's not the only place, personally, that, that I learn to pray and meditate. That's not the only place that, that I learn that I grow closer to God. Um, that's the main place. Now, that, that's my kindergarten. That's my spiritual kindergarten. That's where I've started. Uh, but, I, you know, back to, to getting a sponsor, I didn't want to drag somebody else through my crap, but she basically forced me. She said, either you have a sponsor tomorrow night or don't come back. And so I went to a meeting that night, and I got there right as it was closing. You know, right the meeting list had it at the wrong time. And the guy that was chairing said, if you need help, find a sponsor, see me after the meeting. So I stood by the door, and when he came out of the meeting, I grabbed him by the arm and said, I need a sponsor. And uh, he started me on the steps right away. You know, I had some help in, in treatment, really taking a good look at, at one and two and seeing uh, seeing where my life had, what it had come to and seeing that drinking, anything that happened undesirable, drinking was always involved. Uh, drinking was involved in everything. And so, because I really went to treatment and, and this is, this is, you know, as honest as I know how to be, I really went to treatment to stop using some of the things that I was using so much. You know, I didn't necessarily think alcohol was my problem because I felt like I could still depend on it. But when I got, when I, when I was offered the opportunity to sit down and, and look at these things, you know, I saw without a doubt, you know, I cannot control my drinking once I start. And I have no telling what, there's no telling how many, what I'm going to do. And if I'm not putting it in my body, I'm obsessing about it. You know, where am I going to get it? How am I going to get it? Uh, and it's a miracle today that, that that's been removed. And I can't tell you when it happened or or when I, you know, the book tells us, you know, we'll know the nearness of the Creator, and, and it, it gives us these, these different promises. They didn't all happen to me exactly like the book says, but but they have all happened. You know, they, they, they've come to life. And so this, this to me is not just a life-saving program. It's a life-giving program. And I, I've made some, you know, some lifelong friends in this program. <laughs> Um, you know, I get to be a sponsor today, you know, and that to me, that's a, that's a wonderful privilege. Now there's times when I look at the phone, I'm like, damn, <laughs> I really don't want to talk to him right now. Uh, cause all he's going to talk about is himself. I want to talk about me. <laughs> so, so I've got my sponsor. I can call and talk about me. Uh, but I, I've got some really key people and, and, you know, today I can be, Today, I, I, you know, I tell folks I've got the best job I've ever had today, but I don't know that it's that as much as I'm the best worker I've ever been today. And so I can give what's expected and, and what's, you know, what's required of me today, like, I, like I've never been able to do before. You know, it's not all about me. And, you know, now there's days when it is. You know, I, I have, what I have to do to, to, to stay and grow with God is you know, I listen to speaker tapes, I read, my wife and I try, I say try because we don't do it every morning, but our goal is to read every morning together and, and then, you know, spend some time in prayer together. And, you know, we can tell when we don't do that. I can tell when I don't do it. I can tell when I don't have my own private time. Uh, I can really tell. And, it, you know, every day is not glitter and rainbows and, and just, you know, happy-go-lucky. It's it's life. It's life. But I, but I do understand, and that's one of the best gifts. I've been given is, you know, I'm not, I don't have to live this life alone. You know, I'm never alone. You know, one of the, one of the first things that happened to me, well, is a few months into it. I was talking with my sponsor after a meeting and I thought I smelled alcohol on his breath and I was wrong, you know, but I was looking for a, a flaw. You know, that, that's what it was, but it dawned on me then, you know, what if, what if he was drinking? Would I have to go drink? And, you know, I realized right away, no. I wouldn't. You know, my, my sobriety doesn't depend on him. It doesn't depend on, you know, anybody else. My sobriety depends on me and God. And, you know, I heard a heard a, a friend of mine tell me the other night that in order to have a success rate with a certain type of person as a sponsor, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And, you know, I totally disagree. My success rate is my sobriety. You know, if I stay sober through working with a, another person who's at least, you know, showing up, then, you know, I'm 100%. And, and that's what I have today. And, and this, this program is, is, it's amazing. And, you know, if I ever stop going to meetings and, and giving back, then I really believe that's, that's the most selfish thing I could do. And so that's why I continue because my sponsor had been there six years when I got there. So I'm, I'm so grateful today that, that he didn't just say, well, I feel better. I'm, I'm gone. 
because I don't know what would have happened. So I, I want to be there. And plus, out of four kids, I have a feeling, a pretty strong feeling, there's going to be at least one or two that might need a spot in here. So <laughs> y'all help me keep them a spot warm. But thank y'all for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.